Good morning. morning. Welcome to the morning worship service of Harvest Presbyterian Church, and I appreciate everybody's attentiveness to the music dying out and taking their seats so I don't have to uh, give you that admonishment. So uh, I'd like to draw your attention to page 10. I hope you all found your way to a bulletin this morning. I just want to highlight a couple events. There's a section uh, about this week at Harvest. discussing or listing there the uh, what the uh, teen girls, the ladies, and the men's will be uh, studying and reading this week. Um, the ladies have a fall meet and greet scheduled. You see that listed there. And we still do need a couple of um, volunteers uh, to help run our, our, our programs here for Sunday morning. So I just pray that you would uh, look at at that and pray if you are willing to uh, help serve and additionally um, the uh, the work day on this November 16th just pray that you would put that on your schedule uh, and come out and help us uh, to maintain not only this this building uh, but our grounds and if you have further questions I'm sure the deacons could uh, highlight of what what uh, what we would be doing uh, and with that uh, I'd like to uh, ask us all to uh, ha- have a moment of silence uh, to prepare our hearts and mind to worship him and if we could all uh, in, in turn back to page two uh, where we'll call each other to worship here in a moment. Would you all please stand so we can call each other into worship. Praise the Lord. Good, you do praise his name, God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and he gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond all measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Let us continue to worship him in song by singing hymn 235, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Oh, good. 
Let us call upon this God who is worthy of glory, honor, and invocation together from the Psalms. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us pray together. Our Father and our God, we give you glory and laud and honor this day for you alone, our God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one from whom every good and perfect gift comes. You are the Lord, the Lord merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You are the Lord, the one who's always been a shield and a strong tower to your people, a very present help in time of need. And we come to you this day needing to, to look to you, to sing to you, to praise you, to pray to you, to hear from you. And so, Father, come, dwell among your people, be enthroned upon our praises, speak to the depths of our souls, and make us glad with the grace and forgiveness and sonship that is ours in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, humble us, Father, for we are needy children, and you are our almighty God. For we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I receive the Lord's greeting. To the church of God gathered in Jacksonville, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Christian, where, where is your focus? Where are you, dear Christian? Citizens of this earth. But your true citizenship is in heaven. And you must think of your God. You must consider yourself as being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. How are you living? Hear the word of the Lord as we are called to confess our sins. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Your Christian, your life is not found in sexual immorality, impurity, illicit passion or evil desire, or idolatry. Or ultimately, it is not found in anything in this world, Christian. And because of those things, the wrath of God is coming on all who do not look to Christ. But for you who believe, the wrath of God has already come, hasn't it? Christ bore your sins in his body on the cross. And yet we must consider our ways and confess our sins before the Lord this morning. And so let us pray to him and sing to him and call upon him to have mercy uh, together as God's people. Holy God. Holy God. Holy and mighty. Have mercy, have mercy on us. Oh, holy God, holy and mighty. Have mercy. 
mercy on us. And corporately confess our sins together. Let us pray. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned through my own fault in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Let us confess our sins silently before the Lord together. Our Father and our God, we come to you confessing our sin as those who are dead to sin and alive to you in Christ. We come to you as those whose lives are hidden in Christ with you, who are loved and received and cleansed and washed with the precious blood of our Savior that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, all lust, all sexual morality, all impurity, all evil desire. And we thank you that we come to you. You know our sin, you know us, and yet you forgive us for the sake of Christ. And so may you change us to make us more holy, ever more loving you and the things of you, for your glory, hating sin, turning from evil and doing good. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us even now by assuring us of that grace and forgiveness that is ours for the sake of Christ, through your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, To you who are trusting in Christ, hear the promises of God's grace and forgiveness to you from the Apostle Paul. The book of Romans, God declares to us, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Dear Christian, I declare to you, though your sins are great and many, they have been counted on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the record of your transgressions is blotted out and your everlasting salvation is hidden in Christ who will resurrect you on the last day. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us stand together and sing uh, to the Lord hymn number 468. My faith has found a resting place. Mm-hmm. My faith. My faith has found a resting place From guilt my soul is free I trust the ever-living one His wounds for me shall be I need no other argument I need no other plea It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I come to him. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart. 
heart. My heart is leaning on the word, the perfect word of God. Salvation by my Savior, salvation by His blood. I need no other. died and that he died for me my great physician my great physician he is awake the lost he came to save for me his precious blood he shed for me his life he I need no other argument, I need no other plea, it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Amen. Please be seated. Christ uh, died for us. He also uh, lives for us even now. And so hear the words of the Lord. These are the words of your Savior from Matthew chapter 10 uh, in verses 24 and following. And it's a good word for us as disciples because persecution is coming. It was coming for the apostles and Christ tells them how to deal with it. And it's certainly coming for us or our children or our children's children And so hear the words of the Lord. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father's will. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are more valuable than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Just one thing about the rampant wickedness and evil that we see in our world. You see the words of our Lord. He says, nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. That's a great thought. Isn't it a great thought? The best we can hope for in this world is proportionate, proximate justice. There is ultimate justice to every wrongdoing and evil that has ever happened. And we just call that sin, don't we? And all sin either gets dealt with upon the cross for those who believe or it gets dealt with at the second coming for those who are obstinate and unbelieving. That's part of the reason why we must not be ashamed of the Lord or of the gospel. Because that's the only way that people get saved. Especially those who maybe hate the Lord's guts and hate our guts and want us to deny Christ. We must confess him. We must declare the gospel. And so don't be ashamed of your Savior. In the face of persecution, parents teach your children to not love this world or their own lives, but to love the Lord more than anything and to bear witness to him in life and in death. Amen. Let us sing to the Lord Christ, our hope in life and death. 
please stand to your feet as you sing. What is our hope? What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to him belong. Who holds our days within his hands? What comes apart from his commands? What will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing. Oh, sing. Hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing. Hallelujah. Now and ever we bless. Christ, our hope in life and death. Truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good, God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith in his eyes, who pants above the stormy. Unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope spring eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. the grave what shall we sing Christ he lives Christ he lives and what reward will heaven bring everlasting life with him there we will rise to meet the Lord their sin and death will be destroyed will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing, oh, sing, hallelujah, our soul springs eternal. Oh, sing, hallelujah, now and now. Christ, our hope in life and death. One more time. Oh, sing. Oh, sing. Hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing. Hallelujah. Now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Let us go to the Lord uh, together in prayer. Oh Lord, uh, our Lord, how majestic. Uh, is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your glory. We, we see it each day. We, we sense even your goodness, uh, the law you've written on the hearts of all created in your image. As our neighbors who even deny you and, and 
claim to not know you. We suppress the truth and unrighteousness, do so much good in the world. And yet, Father, we are pilgrims. This world is not our true home. We are awaiting the city whose builder and maker is God, whose foundations cannot be shaken. We look around, we see wars, rumors of wars. We think of our own nation, our heart breaks. We see our neighbors in Western Carolina, we pray for them. The devastation, the death, the despairing even of life and the loss of resources, Father, would you um, provide for them water, clothing, shelter, food? Father, would you mobilize your people with beautiful feet of the gospel of peace to come and not just say be warm and be filled, but, but be saved, be forgiven. Father, we thank you for your church. Have mercy on our neighbors in Western Carolina. Father, would you sustain them? Would you come to their aid? Father, we pray for even ourselves. Help us to not be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. Sometimes we look within, it's very dark. Sometimes we look around and things seem so very bad. Give us great courage and strength to live for you, to shine for you, to shine like stars in the midst of a crooked and depraved generation holding fast to the word of life. That word that tells us This is eternal life, knowing you the true God, for there is no other than you, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the one in whom are all the riches and depths of the wisdom and knowledge of God, the one who has all authority on heaven and on earth, the one who has called us out of the darkness of sin into the marvelous light into the grace, into the peace and forgiveness that we have with you. And so we rejoice in our Savior, the one who will come to judge the living and the dead, the one who will come to take us to be with him. Some of us long for that more than ever because we are suffering. We pray for those in the church who who carry the great weight of physical pain and anguish, debilitating disease, the threat of of cancer hanging over them like a guillotine. Father, protect them. Keep them, heal them. We pray for those who walk with just a weariness of soul, depression, anxiety. They're burdened. Father, you see them. You know their fears. You know their pain. Be the lifter of their head even this day. For you love us so very much, Father, would you convey to us not just a sense of your holiness today, but your great love. Oh, Lord, you know uh, the hearts of all your people. We pray for our missionaries that are in an iffy situation. Um, Some of them, deliver them from that place to a place of safety for a season as they long to go back, to be in the fray discipling, shepherding, living for you, even in the face of death. Oh Lord, help us to die daily as we leave this place and head into our families, into work next week, into calls of singleness. Father, may we die to sin, deny ourselves and live to our true selves, that true life of ours that is hidden in Christ with you. We long for his coming. We long for his appearing. We see through a glass dimly, and yet we see truly. We know that you love us. We know that you will not leave us nor forsake us. What can man do to us? So much, Lord, they can. Persecute us, alienate us, 
try to shame us. But we who believe in you will never be put to shame. Thank you for your unbreakable love. Thank you for your spirit. Guide us, Lord. Save us. Keep us this week. Turn us to you, we pray. And guide us as we pray that prayer that your son taught us and commanded us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, as we prepare to give to the Lord, just, um, just a word in light of all that's happening in our state. It says, um, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Obviously, we're taking up an offering here. And it goes to the work of the ministry. The lights are on. You can hear. God provides for me and my family. Praise God for that. But there are so many in our state with great need. I chatted briefly with one of the deacons this morning, and they're going to be working toward trying to provide in a way that will um, get resources actually to the people in need. So as you give, give heartily as to the Lord, and may God give the increase here and do good uh, to our neighbors in the western part of the state. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, please turn with me in the Word of God to 1 Kings. Uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, you'll find the book of 1 Kings after uh, the books of Samuel and before the books of Chronicles. And we're taking just a little bit of a break from uh, Mark's gospel and we're entering the wild world of 1 Kings. And we do so by joining the prophet Elijah here as he returns to the promised land. He had been away for three years, he'd issued a word of judgment. He had declared to Ahab at the beginning of chapter 17, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain, 
these years except by my word. That was a rebuke to Ahab and to the ungodly, idolatrous people of God at that time that they should turn. Ahab, of course, was wicked and he worshipped Baal. And God had given Ahab three years to repent of his sin. And as we come to chapter 18, the two questions before us are, what's happened with wicked King Ahab? And what has happened to the land? We may not know much about what happened to the land, but we know what did not happen. There's been absolutely no rain, no dew. The land remains under God's covenant curse for idolatry and sin. And and we know that there's been no repentance from Ahab or the people. For over three years, the skies have become like bronze and the ground like iron. No repentance from Ahab. But here in chapter 18, things are about to change. And so let us seek the Lord's blessing upon us in a word of prayer. Let us pray uh, together. Our Father and God, thank you for your holy word. May you speak to our hearts of your lordship, of your glory, of your love. of your devotion and regard and care for us, of your commands to us to not be ashamed of you. Father, would you, through your word and spirit, lay bare our hearts and yet strengthen them so that we might live for you, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to consider our passage in, in three parts. Um, First, the deadness of serving the wrong master. Secondly, the danger of serving two masters. We'll see the deadness of serving the wrong master with Ahab. We're going to see the danger of serving two masters with Obadiah. And then we'll consider the delight of serving the true master. And so the question before us is, whom do you serve? Whom do you serve? Hear the word of the Lord from 1 Kings 18. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hands of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my lord is not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, go tell your Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I do not know where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men in the Lord's of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave? And fed them with bread and water. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And will he kill me? And he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet with Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw, when Elijah saw Ahab, I'm sorry, forgive me. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, 
which you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People of God, whom do you serve? Whom do you serve? It had been three years, over three years, since God confronted Ahab with his sin and the judgment of drought way back at the beginning of chapter 17. And God's kindness, of course, was meant to bring Ahab to repentance. And yet, three years later, there has been no rain. There's been no repentance. And here, things are about to change. Elijah steps on the scene once again. He's given the word of the Lord, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Things are about to change. Three years of drought. Three years of famine. And Ahab has changed. Don't miss that. But he has not changed his ways. Ahab has changed for the worse. And such is true when our hearts are unrepentant over our sin. Ahab has not changed his ways. What are Ahab's ways? Beloved, you may recall Ahab, he married Jezebel of the Sidonians. And immediately he began to worship Baal. The Canaanite God who is often in the likeness of a bull, which represented strength and fertility. And Ahab had not turned from Baal or his devotion to power and pleasure and leisure. In fact, here in three years later, Ahab is more entrenched and more hardened in his sin than ever. And such is the deceptive nature of sin, Christian. We are sadly mistaken if we think Ahab is the same man as he was three years ago. And so too with us. Unrepentance makes the heart much harder. And so just a word of application about repentance. Because we are always going to be devoting ourselves (laughs) to someone or something. You're created to worship. It is impossible for you not to be devoting yourself to someone or something. We should always be devoted to God, ultimately and truly. But of course, we don't do that as we ought. And so what has God given us? God's given us the gift of repentance, hasn't he? As we turn to God in Christ, the one who forgives us of our sins, we confess that we've done wrong. When we change our ways, God heals us from disordered devotion. God reorients us toward himself. Beloved, you are never neutral. Whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, week in, week out, year in, year out, you're always being changed for better or for worse. And so I say to you this day, in light of Ahab, watch your own lives. Those sinful Uh, patterns, those occasions uh, for stumbling, that general lukewarmness that can just kind of creep in, you must not tolerate your sin. You know, John Owen, great Puritan preacher, he says, he warns us not to speak peace to ourselves before God speaks it. And God speaks it, doesn't he? He speaks it on Sundays when he declares you're forgiven. He speaks it in the gospel of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also speaks it when you pause and take a moment to pray and to repent, to confess your sins and return to God. He speaks that peace to you. Three years have passed for unrepentant Ahab here. Three years of turning from God, not turning to God. Three years of being hardened by his own sin and idolatry. And we see here with Ahab, our first point is the deadness of serving the wrong master. (laughs) Ahab serving the Baals, he's serving himself. And such idolatry is a deadness that feels alive, doesn't it? That's the deceptive nature of sin. It can feel so very alive at times. 
And so you must be warned today, lest you drift away. Notice what we find Ahab doing in verses 5 and 6. He's on a fool's errand. There's drought and there's famine in the land because of God's judgment. And, and rather than repent, he'd rather double down and go on a fool's errand. Look at verse 5. Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water, to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass. And save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. He's going through all the land, looking to feed his animals. After all, what good is an army that has no horses? No horses to lead his chariots. No horses upon which the troops could ride and reign. What good is an army with no horses or no mules, no beasts of burden to carry supplies to his troops? And so we encounter Ahab here, a most desperate king, don't we? His idols are not the answer. His idols cannot provide what they promise. Strength and futility. But what does he do? Rather than repenting, rather than surrendering to the Lord, he doubles down. He's taking things into his own hands. And just one point of application about serving the wrong master. You know, Ahab's case, it's turning to a self-sufficiency, right? Turning to his own folly, leaning on his own understanding. Oh, he's, he's so much different than us, isn't he? <laughs> You know, things are going to go from bad to worse for Ahab here. They have. And consider how frantic he is. Three years ago, he heard the word of the Lord's judgment from the prophet Elijah. He probably looked around at the green hills of Israel, the green trees. He thought, you know, everything's going pretty well. We'll see about that. You sure about that, Elijah? Are you sure about that? We'll see about that. I'll worry about that later. You know, we can easily think, kind of in the same way, when the Lord brings something to our attention, whether it's a sinful uh, pattern, an ungodly habit, we can easily think, you know, I'll worry about that later. You know, God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Don't mistake his kindness. It's meant to lead you to repentance. In those times where our sin does find us out, we get frantic, don't we? Think of how frantic Ahab is as he scours the land. You know, the other week I was supposed to meet with somebody for lunch and he's in my study, he's doing some writing and it got a good flow, right? And so you're trying to maximize it and I'm starting to cut it pretty close. The thoughts keep coming and so we're just going to keep going. Don't want to be late, right? Don't want to disrespect anybody like that, right? And so it's time to go and I'll grab my keys and get, get to the car and go meet them for lunch and Guess what? I can't find my keys <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> and one of my biggest fears is I'm always locking, locking myself out of my study with my keys in my study. Okay, that's a fear. This other fear is like, where are my keys? I should just keep them in my pocket, right? That's what any smart person would do. But, you know, I don't like to be imbalanced and whatever. I'm just kind of high maintenance that way. I could not find my keys anywhere. I'm ripping through my study. I'm almost going to overturn Micah's office. I don't want to do that. Okay, where are the keys? I'm running around frantically. They turn out to be in the kitchen. Who would leave their keys there? I think I did that when I went to get a water. I'm frantic. Think of how frantic Ahab is. Ahab knows if he has no horses, there's no strength in Israel to wage war. Think of Psalm 147. Speaks of the Lord. It says he prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives beasts their food. It goes on to say, his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor is pleasure in the legs of man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. And yet here is idolatrous, unrepentant Ahab doubling down on his own sin, trusting more in the strength of horses, in his own legs, in his own wisdom than the Lord of Israel. Ahab's trusting more in his arm than the Lord's arm to save. And so what we have here, Christian, belabor this point because we are all prone to it. A picture of the eventual weakness and helplessness and desperation of those who reject the Lord and serve the wrong master. They wander around. 
heart hardened to God's judgment, eyes full of the earth, focused on themselves and their plans, trying to, trying to overcome or suppress God's judgment by their own resources. Beloved, such is the bankruptcy of devoting yourself to anything not the Lord. So Christian, I say to you, turn to the Lord. Despise your own self-sufficiency. Always be repenting and returning to the Lord, the Lord who loves you, who loves to receive you, who loves to forgive you, to heal you and to restore you. We've seen with Ahab, wicked Ahab, the deadness of serving the wrong master. Let us consider Ahab's servant Obadiah. With Obadiah here, we see the, the subtle yet great danger of serving two masters. It should hit close to home for many of us. Notice the first thing we learn about Obadiah in verse 3 there is his name. Obadiah, literally in the Hebrew, means servant of Yahweh. Servant of Yahweh, just as Elijah means my God is Yahweh. You have two guys with great names in this passage. Servant of Yahweh, Obadiah, my God is Yahweh with Elijah. Bear that in mind. That is the key to understanding this passage. It's rather ironic as we meet Obadiah, the servant of Yahweh. Where do we find him? We find him serving in the palace of Ahab. The servant of the Lord is over the household of wicked, idolatrous, Baal-worshipping King Ahab. There's some irony and ambiguity there of Obadiah. And it becomes even greater in verses 3 and 4 when we read that Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And this ambiguity is hinted at again in verse 6 when we read that Ahab went one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And so as we come to the end of verse 6, we're left with a great question. Whom does Obadiah truly serve? Does he serve Yahweh and the Lord as his name implies? Or does he serve wicked King Ahab? Obadiah, whom do you serve? We're about to find out. Look at verse 7. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him, and Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my Lord, Elijah? Here in verse 7, Obadiah, servant of Yahweh, servant of Ahab, meets God's prophet Elijah. And you see him falling down and crying out, Is it you, my Lord, Elijah? How many lords do you have, Obadiah? Two is one too many. Elijah responds with the rebuking command in verse 8, Note the words of Elijah. And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. And you may be asking, Pastor, where's Elijah's rebuke? Note the words of Obadiah carefully. Is it you, my Lord, Elijah? How did Elijah respond? Go tell your Lord, Elijah is here. You see, Elijah is telling Obadiah straightforward, Obadiah, you don't serve me. You serve wicked, idolatrous, rebellious King Ahab. It is I, go tell your Lord, Elijah is here. And you notice how Obadiah responds. It's kind of easy to miss. Notice his protest there in verses 9 through 14. This is a central part of the entire passage. It's the longest speech of the narrative. It's one speech. And in it, we see Obadiah pleading for his life. Go tell your Lord Elijah's here. You trying to kill me? <laughs> How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah's here. As soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you away. I, don't, I won't know where. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Skip ahead to the end. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah's here, and he will kill me. Oh, Bediah pleads with Elijah. He pleads with Elijah. Did you hear his protest? How have I sinned that you give me to the hands of Ahab that he might kill me? If Ahab cannot find you, he will kill me. Such is the protest of Obadiah. Even without giving Elijah a chance to respond, Obadiah continues, I feared the Lord from my youth. Have not you heard, Elijah? 
Jezebel's killing the prophets. I kept them safe. I, I fed them. I supplied them. And now you say, behold, Elijah is here. Go tell your master. Go tell your Lord. Obadiah seeks to identify himself as a servant of Elijah. And as a servant of Elijah, a servant of Yahweh. But just like his name at the end of verse 12, I feared the Lord since my youth. Have you not heard what I've done? He basically says, do not my actions speak for themselves? Do not the works of my hands show to you, prove to you that I am a servant of the Lord? He contrasts himself with wicked Ahab. Ahab can't even find food for his mules. Obadiah feeds the prophets of the Lord. He contrasts himself with wicked Jezebel who's killing the Lord's prophets. He saves and spares the Lord's prophets. Let me just say two things about Obadiah's good works. They are truly good works, beloved. And God loves good works. But by way of application... How easy is it for just to justify our compromise of serving two masters by comparing ourselves with those who serve the wrong master? Don't do that. Don't serve two masters and don't even compare yourself with yourself. Compare yourself with the word of God. Obadiah makes his boast in the works of his hands. You know, when we come to the end of verse 14, he's basically saying, look, Elijah, haven't I done enough? But you notice Elijah remains unimpressed. You see his response in verse 15. As the Lord of hosts lives before him whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. And you're thinking, what? You know, have you ever had a conversation with someone, whether a loved one or just, you know, someone, you just kind of poured your heart out. You just kind of bear it at all. A very close friend or a loved one. You divulge something important, something personal. You put your heart on the line and there's a big pause. And then um, some silence. And then they, they change the subject. <laughs> they, they start talking about themselves or, or the weather or something else. Elijah makes no comment about Obadiah's fear of death. He makes zero comment about Obadiah's great works of his hands. He doesn't even encourage Obadiah. He doesn't say, well done, good and faithful servant of Yahweh. He doesn't say, keep it up, good work. Elijah does not even acknowledge what Obadiah has said or done. In fact, we might even say Elijah is too hard on Obadiah. And so we have to ask, why does Elijah, this man of God, this prophet of the Lord, appear so hard on Obadiah. Well, Christian, it's because Elijah and the God whom he serves are not satisfied with ambiguity and the ambivalence of the double-minded who would serve two masters. Whom do you serve, Christian? Who does Obadiah serve? Does he serve Yahweh as his name implies? Or does he serve wicked, idolatrous King Ahab? The answer is given for us in verse 8. It's really in the Hebrew text. Most English translations are ESV included. They have two words there that aren't even included in the original version. You see, after Elijah in verses 8, 11, and 14... There are no words after Elijah. Look closely with me there in verse 8. Is it you, my Lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. Perhaps some of your Bibles might have the words, is here in italics, which of course mean they shouldn't be there because they're not there in the Hebrew. Verse 8 literally reads, It is I. Go tell your Lord. Behold, Elijah. Elijah. Do you remember what Elijah means in Hebrew? It means my God is Yahweh. 
My God is Yahweh. Elijah is telling Obadiah, you see what he's commanding Obadiah to do to wicked, idolatrous, Baal-worshipping King Ahab. What is Elijah requiring Obadiah to say? Go tell your Lord, my God is Yahweh. No wonder Obadiah pleads for his life. Obadiah understands, make no mistake about it, he understands the cost of confessing the Lord. He knows to make such a confession before Ahab is tantamount to a death sentence. The killing, the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah pleads for his life. Verses 9, 12, and 14. He will kill me, he will kill me, he will kill me. Elijah has forced the issue. It's the same thing that God does when he forces the issue with you. When he begins to convict you of your sin. Of your double-mindedness. Of your dual devotion. To anything that is not God. I don't care how good it is. I do care how evil it is. What are you going to do? See, the underlying issue throughout this entire passage is, is not just whom Obadiah serves, but who does he trust? What has been his boast throughout this entire passage? It's been the work of his hands. Look what I've done. Has it not been reported to you? Spare the prophets. I hid them. I sustained them. Elijah says nothing. He dismisses those boasts entirely. He presses Obadiah to see that he does not truly and fully trust the Lord. Elijah is pressing Obadiah to see that his confidence is not fully in the Lord, but in himself. Elijah's pushing Obadiah to see that Obadiah is ashamed of the Lord, afraid to confess the Lord before the wicked. Whom do you serve, Christian? Who is your master? You know, it's the Lord of the heavens and the earth, isn't it? This God who created you, who's forgiven you in Christ, this one who's the judge of all, the one who's made you, who's given you life and breath. That is who your Lord is. It cannot be the Lord and Ahab. It cannot be the Lord or something else. Remember the words of our dear Savior. We cannot serve two masters. Remember who he said that to. He said that to those who were following him. You know, we must be honest enough with ourselves this morning to acknowledge there's a very real temptation for us to serve two masters. We must repent and return to God. Notice our final point here, the joy of serving the true master. Look at verse 16. You know, we learn that Obadiah finally goes and tells Ahab. What does he tell him? You know, we can't be sure. But as Ahab goes out to meet Elijah, notice what Ahab says. Is it you, you troubler of Israel? Ahab can't even address him as Elijah. He can't even take the name of Elijah on his lips. Ahab is so hardened so rebellious, so obstinate, he cannot even bring himself to say, Elijah, my God is Yahweh. He identifies Elijah as the troubler of Israel. Elijah rebukes him for his sin and idolatry and his rebellion, challenges them to a duel on Mount Carmel. You can read about that later this afternoon in the rest of chapter 18. I'd encourage you to read about that. But what is God setting before us in this passage? You know, the first Six verses. We have three simple sections. The thing dealing with Ahab and Obadiah, it's a relatively short section, first six verses. The last section, verses 17 through 20, dealing with Ahab and Elijah is relatively short. It's a central section. That, those verses 7 through 16, it's the longest. And it's the Lord's way of setting before you the centrality of the reality Of whom do you serve? That's the question. We're not given the outcome of Obadiah. We know he went to Ahab. 
We don't know what became of him. We don't read of this Obadiah again in the scriptures. He first appears on the scene in 1 Kings 18 and he leaves the scene in 1 Kings 18. He never occupies the stage again. The story with Obadiah is left somewhat open-ended. Did Obadiah pay for the confession with the cost of his life? Was there any cost to Obadiah? We, we simply don't know. And I think it's intentionally left open-ended so that the question might be pressed upon you and upon me. Whom do you serve? Whom do you serve? You know, it's one thing to make that confession here, dressed in our Sunday best, in this beautiful building, with no fear of hindrance or fear of ridicule or persecution or death. But it's quite another when there is a cost. Whom do you serve? It's an issue of life and death. In this passage, you have the, the declaration, Elijah, my God is Yahweh, linked every time with the threat of death. Verse 8, the confession. Verse 9, the threat of death. Verse 11, the confession. Verse 12, the threat of death. Verse 14, the confession and the threat of death. For Obadiah, the threat was very real. You make the confession, you pay the price. The price for us, it may not be our lives. But living for the Lord may mean your livelihood. It may mean your reputation in the world. Someday it may be your life. Because there is a price to be paid no matter what. So we're reminded of our Savior's words. If your goal is to save and preserve your life for the sake of the world, you will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake gains it. Let me tell you, Christian, there's nothing to be ashamed of about your Savior and the God that loves you. He is your God and he says to you, don't be ashamed of me. I've created you. I've called you. I've given you new life in Christ. I've saved you from your sin. I'll save you from hell. Each day I clothe you. I shelter you. I provide for you. Don't be ashamed of me. For I'm not ashamed of you in spite of your sin. I died for you. That death you face, I was raised for you. You may be ashamed of yourself at times. I am not ashamed of you. I love you. For you belong to me. And nothing in creation will ever separate you from my love. Those are God's words to you. Not sin, not Satan, not even death itself, Christian. Remember, Christ made the good confession before Pontius Pilate. And he paid for it with his life. Beloved, what is your confidence? Think of your God who came for you in Christ, unwavering in the face of persecution, unwavering in the face of death itself, even with his last breath, shedding his blood to save you. Into your hands I commit my spirit. May you say the same thing. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, but committed and continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. You know, Luther had it right, didn't he? Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. The body, they may kill, they will kill. God's truth abideth. Still, his kingdom endures forever. And the question that we are left with, whom do you serve? There is joy in serving and loving God. And the change that you will see when you wake up and you say, my God is the Lord, Elijah. You'll see it in the way that you experience yourself and the world, those in authority over us when you realize God will never put us to shame. And the change is that you, you'll see, you, you'll go from, um, you know, we're changed from loving God for our own good to loving with God what God loves. And loving with God what God loves is the most beautiful way to live. 
there's a self-forgetfulness there. When you love with God what God loves, there's a freedom, there's a peace, there's a rest. You might think about that. Well, pastor, you know, loving uh, God for our own good and then loving with God what God loves. I don't know. That seems like a distinction without a difference. I'd say it's good you're thinking about it. Start praying about it. Because as you love with God what God loves, you know, there's this, this thing called resonance. And you see it in music. When two people are playing together and they're just playing in such perfect harmony, just flying along, being carried along in sync, in unison with each other, perfect harmony. And that's what it means to, to love with God what God loves. You have this rich communion with God, this participation with God, this harmony with God as he, as he works in and through you and empowers you to love with God what God loves. Oh, dear Christian, it's the only way to live. It's the best way to live. To love with God what God loves. To say, my God is Yahweh. This is true of you who believe. And so, dear Christian, it'll be true for you forever. Elijah, your God is the Lord. And you are his people. And God's people said, amen. Let us pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for this tumultuous time in your land, a wicked king leading your people astray, hardened in his own heart with the wild, rebellious, idolatrous wife. And yet you come to a servant who is between a rock and a hard place. You come to him with your word. And you confront him with the truth that he is to live for you and to declare you in life and in death. Father, so many instances in our lives where we must do the very same thing. Would you help us to love with you what you love? You love yourself ultimately, truly. May we do that by your grace. May that be our joy, not whatever we want to change in this world or our lives or others, but you, the God who loves us and receives us. And so, Father, help us to also love with you what you love as it relates to ourselves, others, and the world. Keep us. Help us not to be ashamed of you, for you are not ashamed to call us your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us um, stand together and sing uh, to the Lord. We'll do so uh, by singing him. 358 for all the saints. By faith be for the world confess thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thou wast there wrong. Fortress and their might, thou Lord, their captain in the well fought fight. Thou in the darkness drear their one true light. Oh, hallelujah.
Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the, resur the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen, amen. We have the faith together there in your liturgy. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift our hearts up to the Lord. Great is the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's sing to the Lord. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, in the power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Please be seated. 
It is the most beautiful thing that the Lord who is holy, heaven and earth are filled with his glory, his might, his majesty would humble himself, take upon our flesh and blood to save us from our sins. That is what is shown forth here at this table. The one who came to bear witness to the truth, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. No one took his life. He lays his life down on his own accord. And he has taken it up again, Christian. So look beyond this table. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's instituted this meal. This is his table. The sacramental signs point to his broken body that was broken for you and his shed blood to cleanse you from all of your wickedness, all of your unrighteousness, all of your sin. And this table is for you. And he longs to nourish you by his Holy Spirit as you partake by faith. And so, Christian, you who have been baptized, who professed your faith before the Lord and his church, who are repentant over your sin, not perfectly, for there is only one who is perfect. And he longs to feed you at his table. And so let us pray this blessing upon this holy feast together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who made the good confession and who still even makes it now. The book of Hebrews has him taking these words upon his lips. Here I am and the children you have given me. He's doing that even now as we worship and especially so as we eat and drink by faith upon him for our salvation. Oh, may you by your spirit Use these common elements to a most holy end. Seal your love and grace to our hearts. Help us as we hold them, as we taste them, as we see them, to know that you are our God, that you love us, that you forgive us, and that we are your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after the supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of their sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For dear Christian, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This meal is not for those who are unbelieving. It is not for those who are unrepentant. It is not for those who have not professed their faith before the Lord. But consider Christ and his goodness and his great salvation, Christian, and come to the table. This meal is for you.
body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Father, we thank you uh, for your great love and your forgiveness and your kindness that not only brings us to repentance but saves us from all of our sins through the gospel. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your spirit. You shed abroad your love in our hearts. Help us to, to confess with our lips that Christ is Lord. To show up by our hands and what we love in our hearts, what we set our minds upon this week, for you are our God, and we are your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us stand together and sing the doxology to the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Just a reminder, there's uh, all church potluck uh, right after the service and the fellowship also. Feel free to join us for that, whether you brought anything. Just bring yourselves. Uh, receive the Lord's blessing upon you as you prepare to go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.